Paul, to this our 72nd Bowes Annual Scientific Meeting. It's now 24 months since my illustrious predecessor, Adrian Joyce, put this medal around my neck, and it will be my pleasure to pass it over to our very worthy new president of Bowes tomorrow at the AGM, Kieran O'Flynn. What we've decided to do, because the John Anderson Award has been awarded to Anne's Khan, we're going to take the John Anderson Award first. And we've got an outstanding recipient of the award this year. This award was instigated by Baus and John Anderson's family. And Sarah Anderson, his wife, has been very much involved in selecting the person for the award. It goes to either an outstanding trainee or a consultant who's either done a single amazing event or has consistently managed very high care for some time. So it's my pleasure to invite Graham Conn, one of his colleagues from Scotland, up to the podium to say a few words about Anne's. Graham. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I've known Anne's for well over 30 years, man and boy. He was his medical student when, when we first met and his great claim to fame was that he was an incredible, dangerous sportsman. Um, he was an incredibly fit person, and he had the slowest heart rate of anyone in the Western world, I think. I think at one point it was one beat every two minutes, or thereabouts. <laughs> Remember when at the first day I met Anne, he came up to me and said, Graham, feel my pulse, it's really slow. <laughs> But anyway, he was, in, he was involved from a young age in very dangerous sports, the rock climbing where you go up the under, underhanging part of the, of the rock and hanging on like a fly, off-piste skiing and then subsequently hang gliding, of course. Um, that resulted in a number of minor injuries, which was very irritating when Anse was a trainee, when suddenly Anse had broken his ankle or something like that and didn't turn up for a few weeks. Um, but at the same time as, as doing his sporting activities, kind of as a, as a, as a pastime, Anne's trained as a, as a urologist uh, and got a consultant job in Lanarkshire. And then in 2002, Anne was, was training with the, the British hang gliding team in Spain and had what Anne refers to as a hard landing, suffering multiple injuries, uh, most notably a T4 complete paraplegia. Um, he was transferred from Spain back to the spinal injury unit in Glasgow, where I, where I work. Um, and we were all absolutely devastated for Anse that it really, to us, was the end of a, of a very promising surgical career. Um, Anse looked on this slightly differently from us. I don't think he quite looked on it as being just another slight flesh wound. I think he appreciated the gravity of the, of the injury. But there were two things in Ansi's mind at that time, and one was how he was going to tell his girlfriend what he'd done to himself this time, uh, and secondly, how he was going to get back to his major love, which was, was open renal surgery. Um, this is where Baus came in. Now, Jim Bramble was president at the time. Jim was very enthusiastic in, in uh, helping Ansi get back to full working practice. And he commissioned Bob Meddings, who was regional representative for the West of Scotland, to, to do a complete review of ANSI's, of ANSI's work and see if he could get back to, to full working. Um, Bob assessed and mentored and approved ANSI to get, to get back to, to full-time work again, uh, which I have to say we thought was not that much out of the ordinary because we were used to Ants doing daft things all the time anyway. Um, but it was only when you look in the literature that you realise that it's absolutely unique worldwide for someone with a, a, a disability such as Ants has now to get back to, to major intracavitary surgery. This is Ants operating. Uh, and it's not dissimilar to the previous slide, where he's essentially hang gliding over the operating table here. Um, I, did, I did ask Anse why he had not publicised this earlier, uh, when it was 2002, his injury, and why it, you know, he'd, he'd really been dragged kicking and screaming to giving a talk at a meeting that I organised a year or two ago, um, and then wrote an article about it. And the reason he said was that his girlfriend and he were quite superstitious um, and they worried that publicising this might damage their streak of good luck that they've had over, the, over many years. So that's worth thinking about. 
I am very pleased that Anse has, has decided to, to come clean and, and show everyone what he's been able to do over the years, which has been absolutely inspirational. I'm also delighted that he's been awarded uh, the, the John Anderson Medal by, the, by, by Bouse and involved with the, with the family of, of another inspirational surgeon, John Anderson. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should give Anse Khan a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I feel hugely honoured and would like to thank Mrs Anderson and the panel for the award. Um, my inspiration will always be my friends and colleagues, but primarily my patients. Um, a great man said, it always seems impossible until you do it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to give you the presidential address for um, 2016. Um, some of the older people like myself uh, are not necessarily that great with social media, so please involve yourself if you're interested. You can follow Baus at, at Baus Urology, or you can hashtag Baus16 and actually get involved by putting pictures uh, and debates up there. I'd particularly like to thank Vipad Modgill, who sort of advised Baus and the JCU for that matter, in matters to do with social media over the last couple of years. Now you can't run a meeting like this, you can't set it up and make it succeed without a significant input from quite a few people. And the two people I'd like to thank most are Duncan Summerton, who will of course follow Kieran O'Flynn as the next president of Baus in 2018, and, and Paul Jones, who's the Honorary Secretary-elect. And they've put together a very good four-day scientific program with really excellent training and teaching courses. So I'm very grateful to them. Yesterday, we had a very successful meeting of three of the sections from academic, from andrology and female and neurourology. And the rest of the sessions, as the last session we've just had, has had a very big input from both oncology and endourology. So you see there the pictures of the five presidents of the various sections, and I'm very grateful to them. But behind these sort of academic magicians, there are two people who've really made this meeting work and become successful. And I'd really like to thank Hannah Doyle, who's been our events manager for some years now and run several Bows meetings very successfully, and Harry Heal, who works with her to make all this possible. So I am very grateful to them. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, and there are pictures there of some of the major sponsors who've taken the symposia or have specifically supported the skills courses and the other events we're doing. So please go to the exhibition area, walk around, thank the people for coming and make them feel welcome because we need these people to run these meetings, in fact, to run the organisation generally. I'd also like to thank the 22 overseas guests and lecturers who some have already lectured to us, more will come in the next few days. Go up to them, introduce yourself, make them feel welcome, and I'm sure we're going to learn enormous amounts from these very gifted people. Who would have thought that could have possibly happened? Interestingly, only a couple of months ago, the last regional meeting I went to, in fact, my 30th meeting regionally over the last four years, which was a joint meeting between Wales and the Southwest. And there was a motion there, this house believes that British urology will be better outside Europe. The motion was roundly defeated, and yet that's exactly the situation we're in. So we're gonna to have to relearn what it's all about. The impact may not be that great, but the truth is, like the whole thing to do with Brexit, we really don't know. And then when we thought the impossible could never happen, England lost in the football last night, which is pretty unbelievable. 
So where have I been in the last 12 months? Well, there were lots of trips around the world. The first one in the autumn last year was my wife and I went over to the Irish Society of Urology and were entertained extremely well by John Thornhill and his team from the Irish Society. And they have been really good at working with BAUS and making this succeed. In November, 10 of us went over as British urologists to Colombo in Sri Lanka, and we did a joint meeting between Slouse, the Sri Lankan Association, and BAUS, which I think worked very well, having done the same thing two years earlier, and were hoping to do the same thing again in October or November 2017 by taking a joint group out there with, with representation from the section of urology, the RSM, and BAUS, meeting up with the Slouse people. The first big meeting of this year was an excellent Indian meeting in Hyderabad. UZICON is a really big, vibrant organization, and we were made very welcome there, which was great. And it's good to see Rajiv Sood, who's the president of the Urological Society of India, here at this meeting. The next big meeting was the European one, an enormous meeting in uh, Munich, which went off very successfully, a very bright, very vibrant meeting. And it's great to see Chris Chappell here, who of course is the Secretary General. After that, we went off to one of my favorite meetings, which is the Australian and New Zealand meeting. And it was absolutely superb on the Gold Coast, on the East Coast of Australia. And we've built enormous bridges between Usance, the Australasian Society, and BAUS. They're now using the same database, Dendrite, to collect data on, on nephrectomies, and we have really good working relationships. So it's great to see my good friend and colleague, Mark Frydenberg, who's the president of USANTS here with us today, and also Michael Nagara, who's their chief exec. And then finally, the biggest meeting of all was, of course, in May, the AUA, and it's great to have Bill G here, who was the president of that meeting in San Diego, and we're working very closely with the AUA, and for the last four years now, we've run a very successful joint meeting between USANTS, BAUS, and the BJUI at that meeting, and it will happen again next year in Boston, which I'm sure will be very successful. There's been some other things, non-academic things. It's brilliant that these two groups, the big group came up yesterday and arrived over three days from the College of Surgeons cycling for Tuff and have raised nearly 30,000 pounds and a slightly smaller group who left a day earlier from Southampton and Taunton, which cycled up as well, so that's good. Once again, there was a very successful football competition last night, and for the first time ever, the old stars actually beat the, the sorry, the old stars beat the, the old stars beat the old stars, that's right. So the consultants actually beat Surge for the first time on record, and Yorkshire won the overall competition. And I'd like to thank Altav Majira for making this possible. Now, the thing, in my opinion, that makes Baus strong, makes Baus box well above its weight, is actually the people on this slide. That is our executive, fantastically run by Anne Bishop and Trish Hagen. It really works well because of these people. So if you're up in London, visit the College of Surgeons, go up to the Baus offices on the sixth floor and say hello. I've already mentioned Hannah and Harry, but we've also, we've, we've also got Louisa, who's running the audit program, the outcomes program, and we're getting a lot out of that, and I'll show you quite a bit more about that in a minute. And Linda Sizer, who's our finance manager, who keeps us on the straight of narrow and explains to Ken Anson what VAT is all about and things like that. We've also got one more new staff member who literally started, I think, a week or two ago, Paul Allen, who's also here as well. Now, last year at this meeting, we launched the BAUS website, which has been highly successful. In fact, so su successful that we've won two national media awards because of the quality of this website designed by a company called Light Media. And I'd, I'd like to thank Nigel Bullock, who's sitting at the front here, because Nigel works tirelessly on putting everything in, making it look smart. We send him material that looks pretty average, and he makes it really work, which is very, very useful. We look in that, what you can find there, and this is just a screen dump from the website. Those are your 10 trustees, although I'll disappear off that at the end of this meeting. So these are the people, if you really want to talk to the people who are supposed to be running the organization, and I believe do so highly successfully, these are the individuals running the organization at the moment. But on top of that, if you drill further in, you'll realize that Bowes Council is regionally represented. 
And the next slide shows the people that you've elected for your regions. And these are the people from Ireland, both the Republic and Northern Ireland, from Wales, from the west and east coast of Scotland, and the 11 regions within England. And these are the people you've elected. The names along the right-hand side are the new members who come online at the next council meeting. And I'm very grateful to all these people for the fantastic support and help they've given me over the last two years. Now, one of the biggest projects we're dealing at the moment is this Project 2020. What it basically is, is the English College in London, and that's where we reside, in the top left-hand corner of the Nuffield building left, uh, on the left-hand side of that um, set of slides. What the college wants to do is to take all the functionality from both buildings and put it together in the right-hand older building no, known as the Church, um, George Dance Building. And the idea is, is to make it modern, make it very sleek, use the space better, and it will be a substantial improvement. The problem we have, however, is we're very fortunate in that we've got 3,000 square feet of accommodation up on the sixth floor. We've got lovely views across Lincoln's in Fields. And one of the reasons that Bouse is strong is we have a real identity. We have a front door you can walk in. There's an entity to it. And the problem is that what we're being offered in the new building in 2020 when the refurbishment has been completed is the fifth floor will be completely open plan for all 10 surgical specialties like BOW, so the British Orthopaedic Association, the General Surgeons, etc. And as well as those 10, seven more smaller organizations. And our concern is we will lose the entity of what BOWS is about and will simply look like a subsection of the English College. And BOWS is more than the English College because we report through to the other three Royal Colleges as well. So at the moment, we're in debates with the BJUI, talking to Krishna Setia as the chairman in particular, to see whether perhaps it's time to move out of the English College and actually set up on our own with BJUI and the Urology Foundation Tough. Now, nothing's signed, nothing's definite, and it may be that if the English College improves the facility they're willing to give us, that we may go back in. But if you've got any strong opinions, please let us know. Let the trustees know what you think we should do. The other thing I mentioned as we just started it last year was the new strategy for the next five years, 2015 to 2020. And the three things we picked out were to support the urologist in the workplace. And Kieran O'Flynn has worked tirelessly on a really good document all to do with job planning and its impact on workforce. It's virtually ready. It's got really good bits about how many people we should see in outpatients, how many operating list people should have them, how much extra time we should have for the other responsibilities that many of you take on. This document will go to trustees in July and will hopefully come out in the autumn and will be extremely valuable. The second thing we wanted to do was to make BAUS the leading professional authority. In other words, the go-to place if there is an issue that's urological. And we're looking at different ways of doing that, but I will say a little bit more in this category about the section review in a moment. And finally, we want to make sure that even though BAUS is really good, it functions really well, that it continues to do so, that it is truly fit for purpose. And top of that is the Project 2020. Now, one of the things we're really proud of are the sections of BAUS. They have been really successful. It was my old boss, Fletcher Dean, a Glasgow consultant, when he was president of BAUS 17 or 18 years ago, who started the first section of oncology, and it all developed from there. But the question is, is it still really fit for purpose, or should it evolve or change? I don't know the answer to that, but I am really pleased that my old friend and colleague, Malcolm Lucas, has agreed to run this to find out what the membership wants. Now, Malcolm's at this meeting. He's walking around in different sessions. He will be on the bow stand at certain times. Please go up and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. On top of that, log into the BAUS website. With log in as a member, you can go to the members forum and Malcolm's written the beginning of the forum there. If you want to set off a debate, write some comments, ask some questions, and we can develop that within the membership. If you don't want to do that, which is publicly, not publicly visible, but visible to your colleagues, then please go back and look at the email that Baus sent you a few days ago on the 21st of June. That was the email you all got with a link to a very short, succinct, and very good Survey Monkey. 
and it asks you which sections you belong to. Is it good? Is it bad? What could be done differently? Have we got too many session, um, sections or not enough? Work your way through it. It is really important. When you click on the link, a front screen comes up that looks like that, and off you go. And for one lucky member who does this, they will get their annual subscription free for the next 12 months. So that's worth a significant sum of money. Another thing slightly contentious is if BOUSE is going to represent British urology and not just British urological surgeons, perhaps next year in 2017, we ought to be having a debate about the name of BOUSE. We could change it roughly in line with the EAU or the AUA, or we could make BOUSE stand for the British Association of Urological Surgery, so we could then welcome medical students, or perhaps this new group going through universities at the moment of physician's assistants who are being trained in 17 universities at the moment. So give it some thought. But one of the projects I'm really pleased to talk about is the initiative that was set up over 10 years ago and has taken quite a time in gestation. And that is this wonderful educational program, BJUI Knowledge. Now back in January, you were all sent an email link and more than half of you have activated that and can look at the modules. In January, there are 59 teaching modules. What I love about these, because the AUA have got one of these, the EAU have got one, the SIU have got one, but you have to be members to access them. But what's really good about this is in 15 minutes on average, you can go through a module, complete it, answer the questions, and it will then appear in your CPD record. And you can see it growing. Last week, there were 112 modules. You can click on the bit that gives your CPD record, and that is my CPD record from the other day. Interesting, you can see the wide variety of modules that I've actually done. You can see three of them have got a purple rectangle at the bottom, and that's because I haven't added reflection to it, but that means I have to the other seven. So you can do your reflection, you can store it all, and then use it for your appraisal. And who knows, maybe something like this will become part of revalidation in the future. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but Baus has endorsed this product. We've put a certain sum of money into it for this year, which means the whole Baus membership will get free access for at least the next 12 months. And we've set certain criteria for the BJUI to see it evolve and cover the whole curriculum in a reasonable time period to put more funds in potentially next year. Now, when we asked for feedback, 70-something of you did give us feedback, but it was a bit thin in detail we may be expending significant sums of your money from reserves on this project. So please, please tell the trustees what you think about it. Now the piece of work I think in the last two years we've been most successful of, and I've been proud to go around the world to the Australian meeting, the American meeting, and talk about it, is our ability to publish surgeon identifiable data. And this wouldn't have been possible without Sarah Fowler, who's run the databases from years. She adds the statistical input, she manages it, she tells us how to run it, and it has been very successful. We've now got six major audits that we can get involved in, five of which are on the public-facing part of the website, and cystectomy the sixth will go live in September. And I just want to show you a little key from each one of these. Now, the frectum has been running for the longest. We've got four years of data. We've got that great graphic on the right-hand side, which you should have all seen because your data may be there, which looks at complication rates, transfusion rates, mortality rates. And to be honest, to have a mortality rate for all types of nephrectomy of 0.52% is pretty impressive when it includes all the data for England and then length of stay. Now, we've not tried to force any change on anybody, but in reality, the average number done per consultant has risen over the four years from 13 to 17. Number percent has risen, as you can see on the slide. But interestingly, six hospitals have decided, for whatever reason, to stop doing nephrectomy. So we are getting some centralization without force. And we're achieving good data collection. We compare the data with the HES data, and we can show in different years between 70-something and 94% data completion. Looking at radical prostatectomy, we're doing just over 6,000 cases a year by 150 consultants at 64 sites. What's interesting, though, is the median number per surgeon is only 32, and in the two years we've got, we're somewhere between 60 and 80 percenter. 
Now think about it, that is significantly below what the National Commissioners are saying, which simply proves the National Commissioners have actually got no teeth. Because if the local commissioners want you to do the work, it is taking place. But we would expect that the numbers per centre will gradually rise. We can then produce, or you can produce, I clicked on the button to produce that funnel plot myself. That is the positive margin rate for radical prostatectomies. It is perhaps fairly high at 27%. It may be we're not very good surgeons, or it may be we're actually very good at operating on the right patients and not operating on lots of Gleason 6. The public can't see that graph, only members can access it. Let's look at another one, stress incontinence. I'm very pleased that they've chosen to use PROMs. They've got two PROMs in their area. The numbers are relatively low. It's risen from nine per surgeon to 16, and we're getting over 70% of the data in, and we hope that will improve and get stronger over time. If we look at percutaneous nephrolithotomy, highly successful audit, this one, run by a number of people, but particularly Ollie Wiseman, who did a brilliant presentation at the AUA, and this is one of his slides. Ollie and his team have shown that volume by surgeon predicts outcome, and this is really important. The more perks you do, not surprisingly, the better you get at it, the better the outcomes, the better the stone clear rate. We've got to look for more of these messages. Urethroplasty, very complex area, very well run by both the andrology section and the baggers group. They're collecting the type of urethroplasty on that graphic, the complications pre intraoperatively and postoperatively, and then flow rates. And now they're also doing two PROMs and a SHIM score for erectile function afterwards, so developing well. Now, you can't see the cystectomy data at the moment, but it's coming through and it will go live in September but these are a first glimpse of the number. We weren't officially collecting the data for 2013, which is why the numbers were lower. But what I'm pleased to see that even though we've not got all in the data in yet, the number of cystectomies done in 2014 and 2015 didn't rise with the BCG crisis. And it's around 1,700 or thereabouts. More of these are being done robotically year on year. And those are the sort of basic numbers that go with it. Now, I mentioned Louisa Hermans a few minutes ago, and Louisa's worked fantastically hard in this area. Between the different audits, she's had to chase up between a quarter and half of the centres to get data clarification. We've identified somewhere between three and ten outliers, either because their complication rates or mortality rate were higher or other data. They get a slightly challenging letter from myself as BIOS president, which goes to them and their clinical lead. And most surgeons are very good at explaining why they appear to be an outlier. It may be they're a tertiary center, so they are taking on the most difficult cases. And we put that information back into the website to make it clearer. This audit has been mandated in England since 2012 by Bruce Keogh but it wasn't mandatory in the devolved nations. And that's why on average, we were only getting 30% data from Scotland, Wales, and less from Northern Ireland. But thanks to Alan McNeil and myself going up and down three times to Scotland and meeting Catherine Calderwood, the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, it is now mandatory in Scotland as well from April of this year. And we've just started the discussions with the Welsh Office about making it mandatory in Wales. But I think one thing that will really help is Kieran O'Flynn and myself have met the leads from the CQC. Now, the CQC is about the only organization that our chief executives in the hospital is paying attention to. And we are going to make putting data into these one of the parameters for measurement by the CQC, which hopefully will mean there will be a stick big enough to beat the chief executives of the trusts to give you the support you need to put these data in. And these data are being scrutinized. We simply looked at the last six months of last year, and there were 54,000 hits onto the public-facing part of the BAUS website. Now, it's been a great pleasure the last four years, two as vice president and then, and then two as president of this organization. And my wife and I are racing away from here on Thursday afternoon to go as quickly as we can to Artiga and Noto in Sicily, which is where we're heading for. So, I want to end simply by thanking various people. It wouldn't be possible to be president of this organization without the fantastic support that I've had from Ann Bishop and Trish Hagen. They have been absolutely superb and the rest of their team. 
Kieran O'Flynn has been brilliant as vice president, really good, really helpful, and will make an outstanding president for the next two years. And I'd particularly like to thank all the trustees for keeping me on the straights and narrow, challenging me when it was necessary, and making the whole thing work. But you can't do a role like this and travel around the world without great support. And I'd particularly like to thank Helen, my good wife, who's traveled with me and put up with the fact of me working in evenings and weekends. And I'd like to thank everybody. It's been an absolute privilege being your president. Thank you very much. And the final duty of this session is to introduce the St. Peter's Medal. And we've got a fantastic award winner this year. The St. Peter's Medal was set up many years ago and goes to a subject of the British Isles of the Commonwealth who's made a notable contribution to the advancement of urology. And this year, the winner is Maggie Knowles. She was nominated by an enormous number of people listed on that slide, which is fantastic. And Maggie's really been at the forefront of the scientific investigation of bladder cancer for over 30 years. Her scientific achievements have included the development of novel in vitro models of bladder tumors, the identification of a number of important prognostic molecular markers, and also understanding the definition of the molecular subtypes of bladder cancer. She's published widely in many high-level, high-impact journals, and if you really wanted to catch up on this area, a recent paper she published in Nature Review Center, uh, Nature Reviews Cancer, sorry, is a wonderful article entitled Molecular Biology of Bladder Cancer, New Insights into Pathogenesis and Clinical Diversity. Furthermore, and importantly, one of the main reasons that she's won the St. Peter's Medal is she's collaborated for years with urologists, old and young. Many of them have been through her laboratories to get MDs, PhDs, and the like. And so Maggie's career has really been interwoven within urology and bladder cancer research for many years. So it's a great pleasure. Maggie, up you come. So it is a great pleasure for me to award the St. Peter's Medal this year to Professor Maggie Knowles from Leeds University, a very good and very fair winner of this medal. So we're going to give her the medal, take a photograph, and then Maggie will deliver her lecture. Maggie, absolute pleasure. Thank you. So, sorry, Maggie's lecture is entitled Bladder Cancer Research in 2016. Where are we now? Over to you, Maggie. Thank you. Right. So before I talk to you about, about the science. I'm Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored um, that Baus is giving me this award this year, particularly because you're giving it to a scientist, not a clinician. Um, for those of us that do translational research, or what we call translational research, um, most of us hope that at some point it'll have an application in the clinic, um, and that's been my goal over the years. I have to say that um, for bladder, at the moment, our laboratory research hasn't had a substantial impact, but I think it's poised now, and hopefully my talk will, will show that. For a biologist, bladder cancer is really interesting, and it was very clear to me early on that this is a heterogeneous um, group of diseases. The other really attractive thing about it is you can obtain tissues from patients throughout the course of their disease, which is, which is unique, really, um, in, in terms of, of tissues, solid tumor tissues. It's been a rather under-researched area. It's also underfunded. And actually, because there are very few groups working in the area, we have benefited hugely from the scope. We could essentially do what we liked. And, and still, there's huge scope today. So before, before I talk to you about the science, I need to thank some various people, and particularly I want to thank people early in my career who encouraged me um, and gave me fantastic freedom to do what I liked. And actually, that's much more difficult for people starting out today. So Sammy Franks, my PhD supervisor, suggested and made me think about questions that 
really have stayed with me and some of which are still unanswered today. So he, he was instrumental. Later on, when I did my first postdoc at the Middlesex Hospital, Marion Hicks and Roger Berry continued to encourage me and give me freedom, as did Graham Curry when I had my first research group at the Marie Curie Research Institute. Um, so thanks to all of them. Thanks also to past and present members of my lab um, who do all the work now and have put in a lot of hard work over the years, who've also given me really good ideas um, and have been a fantastic crowd to work with. Also my clinical colleagues, I can't see who's out there, but people I've worked with over the years um, have not only um, encouraged us to keep going, have helped us collect tissues. We have a huge tissue bank, thanks to the efforts of various of you. But you've also co-supervised my students and really ensured that the whole group has been well-educated in what this disease is all about, what your key clinical issues are, and particularly kept me on the straight and narrow. Um, so thank you to you all. And finally, thanks to my family, um, my husband David, four children who have been patient, endlessly patient, um, while I've worked at weekends, gone to meetings, etc. Um, so, thank you. Let's just see if I can. Okay. So that was the topic I was given for the talk. Um, and really what I want to give you as my message is that these are really exciting times um, in terms of our understanding of bladder cancer and that in terms of the research we do now, it, all things are possible. I'm not sure clinically whether all things are possible yet, and that's for you to say, but in terms of the lab work, it's difficult now to conceive of a question, a research question that's technically too difficult to ask and, and that's not always been the case. And hopefully this brings really major new possibilities in the clinic too. Of course, in thinking about where we are now, I couldn't fail to look back um, and think about the technical developments that occurred over the past decades, particularly since I started in the lab in the late 1970s. There have been huge developments. Um, starting in the, in the 1970s with some basic techniques. So on the left there, Restriction enzymes were discovered. We could manipulate DNA. We could clone it into plasmids. We could introduce that DNA into cells. Um, and, and that southern blotting, Sanger sequencing, these things were all just in place when I started in the lab. So there was, there was a fairly good toolbox there. Um, moving on, very rapidly, um, we had automated DNA sequencing in the 1980s. Um, by early 90s, there was a low-resolution map of the human genome um, and a vast array of polymorphic markers that we could use to map where things were happening in tumors. In the mid-1990s, DNA microarrays, spotted arrays, allowed us to interrogate genome-wide. And by the turn of the century, of course, we had the first draft of the human genome, and that was when the big omics project started, including one on, on bladder cancer. So in the latter part of that first decade of this century, 2007, 8, and 9, it became feasible to sequence the entire coding exome um, of tumors and whole genomes, even in rather smaller laboratories than the, the huge genome project ones. And the last two things to point out on that slide, um, which are becoming very important now, and the RNAi and CRISPR-Cas9 mediated genome editing. So this was the ability to knock genes down in a cell to test what they were doing, and now to make completely physiological edited changes to the genome. So what were we doing in um, bladder cancer at these various times? So at the very beginning, our research was determined really by what was possible. Studies were descriptive, they weren't hypothesis-driven, and of course now, um, as I said, possibilities are really rather unlimited. So now our curiosity and hypothesis can, can determine what experiments we do. 
and essentially we can respond to clinical need. So a whistle-stop tour of what was going on in those decades, just to bring you up to the present, and perhaps some of you were engaged in lab research in, in various of these decades. So at the very beginning there, in the 1970s, things were descriptive. People were describing the histology of tumors, classifying them histopathologically, looking at outcome, thinking about epidemiology. Some people were beginning to induce bladder tumors in rodents, but again, they were describing them rather than really interrogating them at molecular level. But this was a, an era where tissue culture really ramped up. So some of the tumor cell lines that we know and love and have used for years were derived. Here's RT4 in the lab where I did my PhD with Sammy Franks, before my time, actually. Um, and It was shown that you could um, culture urothelial cells and transform them to a tumorigenic state in vitro. This is a study from my dear friend Ian Summerhays, who's no longer with us. He showed that you could do this. And the interesting thing was, we were thinking about human tumor epidemiology. There was the prediction that there were multiple stages involved in that. And indeed, if you treated cells in culture, these are carcinogen-treated dishes, these are controls. After a very long period, about 100 days or so, these large areas of slowly growing epithelial cells would arise. They were clearly altered. And if you kept them another very long period, um, rapidly growing cell lines that were tumorigenic um, would emerge. So underlying that, there were multiple steps, was the hypothesis. Exciting times. In the 1980s, um, the first human oncogene was identified in a bladder tumor cell line, T24. And the amazing finding was that a single base change in the DNA of that um, cell line, resulting in a single amino acid change in the protein, was sufficient to change a normal gene into a potent oncogene. I remember being absolutely gobsmacked by that. That wasn't what I was expecting at all. I was expecting whole chromosomes to change. So at that time, there were a few groups working on bladder cancer. Um, but as various genes were identified in other tumor types, we started to, imagine, to examine these in bladder tumor samples. And it was really at this time that people started to collect and um, bank human tissue samples for research. 1990s, there was a major increase in um, molecular biological research. So we now had all these polymorphic markers and we were able to map regions of deletion across the genome, um, shown here. Um, and if you can see the detail there, it's showing you that chromosome 9, both arms of that chromosome, are lost in many bladder tumors. Many methods for looking at uh, mutations in genes were devised in this decade. Um, so on the right here is a, is a study where we used single-strand confirmation polymorphism to identify I don't think this point is working, to identify um, tumors that had a, a shift in their band there, um, and Sanger sequencing to identify what the mutations were. Because we had all these polymorphisms, we could map regions of deletion um, very closely. And down there, you see the mapping of the region which contains TSC1 on the, on the long arm of chromosome 9, and that's a bona fide um, tumor suppressor gene in bladder cancer. Similarly, we were mapping amplicons, and I make no apology that a lot of these slides come from our work. It was easier to get these. Other people were doing similar things, obviously. Um, and then importantly, um, it was realized at this time that there were major molecular differences between um, invasive and non-invasive tumor groups in the, in the bladder. And this concept of a, of a two-pathway model was um, suggested by Peter Jones and his group, um, where they suggested that they were not only different, but they um, arose via different pathogenesis pathways. And of course, this is only just being superseded now. And in the past decade, we've moved on now to knowing what some of the genes are and doing functional assays on these. So we might be expressing genes ectopically in cells, shown up there on the left, transforming cells there with one of my favorite uh, genes, FGFR3, a mutant form of that, or knocking it down in a tumor cell line and showing that that inhibits proliferation in those dishes underneath, 
and looking at the downstream signaling consequences of that, so understanding exactly what they do at the functional level. This, that first decade has also seen um, huge studies comparing invasive and non-muscle invasive bladder tumours um, in many genes. So FGFR3 there, which was identified as, as the most commonly mutated oncogene in, in non-muscle invasive tumours, being one of them, and a whole raft of other genes, um, which we've studied and compared and, and can list the differences between those two major groups. Many groups have been searching for good urine-based biomarkers during this period. And the um, genomic studies have um, ramped up hugely. So genome-wide copy number analysis now in that top right um, with spotted array back arrays, we can map um, deletions and amplifications much more precisely across the genome, as you can see there. And of course, the spotted arrays allowed um, expression profiles to be derived in, in, in that decade. So that brings us up to the present. Where are we now? And in my opinion, these are four very exciting areas. And, and I think these are the areas in which I think most clinical application may come in the next few years. Tumor classification um, is showing real precision now um, and, and real clinical apl applicability, and trials are using this now, um, and I'll say most about this. And the other three areas that I'll just very briefly point out um, are the immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are causing great excitement in advanced bladder cancer, um, urine biomarkers. There are urine biomarkers in perfusion now and, and really ready for applicability, and the excellent disease models that we have. So this was the first study from um, Matthias Hogland's group, uh, published in 2012, uh, which showed that genome-wide expression data from tumors of all grades and stages here um, allowed seven subgroups, it's five major subgroups, seven if, if you dig a bit deeper, um, allowed those to be identified by unsupervised hierarchical clustering. Um, and importantly, I wish I could point, but I can't. <laughs> importantly, although these were more or less aligned to tumor grade and stage, it wasn't absolute. So there was an implication here that was a little bit more to be found beneath the surface. So if you're not used to those things, each column is a, is a tumor and red is up-regulated and green is down-regulated expression. Recently, there have been several expression profiling studies that have looked only at muscle-invasive bladder cancer, um, and these are aligned here above that um, uh, Hogland uh, definition at the bottom. And encouragingly, they show overlap. So if you look at the top, the group from um, University of North Carolina identified two major groups, called them luminal and basal, um, because they had features that were rather like luminal and basal breast cancers. And then the two studies underneath, one from MD Anderson, they identified three subtypes, which they called luminal, basal, and TP53-like. And the very large um, uh, international project, the TCGA project, that identified four subtypes and they, they more or less align, which is really encouraging. The nomenclature at the moment is a little confusing, and I wouldn't want you to try and, try and, and, and learn what it is. Um, but they overlap, and hopefully they'll settle into a consensus quite soon that, that can be widely applied. So that's what expression data can tell us. What about um, mutation data and copy number data? This is data from that big TCGA analysis um, of muscle invasive tumors. So on the left is the genomic landscape. So this is showing you, um, you probably can't read it at all, um, mutations and copy number changes. So each column again is a tumor, each line is a gene or a region. Um, and if you take that data, you can cluster it again, um, and they managed to define three uh, clusters. Does this align with the expression data? And yes, it does to a, to a certain extent. I mean, 
there are studies still going on, and this is, is being further refined, but to a large extent, it does overlap. So on the right is some of their expression data. Um, and if you look at uh, their subcluster, one, their cluster one, um, these were tumors with papillary histology mainly. They commonly have FGFR3 mutation. And if you look back on the left, I think there's a highlight, yeah, yes, showing you that in that blue cluster, there are the FGFR3 mutations uh, in one of those clusters. If you look further down the expression data, um, you may recognize that uh, there's a red panel second up from the bottom. These are transcription factors and markers um, that are associated with urothelial differentiation. So these are well-differentiated tumors. Um, and this is an interesting subgroup um, because these are some of the, what we think of some of the non-muscle invasive tumors that progress to muscle invasion. Um, and on the left there, I've just highlighted most of these have lost P16, which is a 9P tumor suppressor gene. So maybe there's a, a signature there of those who will progress in the non-muscle invasive group. For non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, we don't yet have such extended um, expression data, although a paper came out about a week ago and I haven't had a chance to read it sufficiently to, to put a slide together. Um, so soon I think we'll have it. But the genomic data we have suggests there are several subtypes. So on the left here is clustering analysis of copy number data from TA tumors on the very far left. And again, suggesting three or maybe four clusters. On the right, um, from T1 grade 3 tumors, again, you can define um, clusters according to copy number in those, uh, in those tumors. And interestingly, one of those clusters, this was our data, cluster 2, had all the patients that progressed bar 1. Mutation data at exome level is just beginning to emerge now for non-muscle invasive tumors. There hasn't been a, a large um, international project this is our unpublished data. Hopefully, it'll be published soon um, for 82 stage TA grade 1 or 2 tumors. And if you have an eagle eye, and you probably couldn't have seen the names of the genes on the, on the muscle invasive um, plot, um, but there are quite distinct differences here. Um, and a feature that's really important for these non-muscle invasive tumors is they have chromatin modifier mutations in profusion, much higher rate than in the muscle invasive tumors. So there may be some epigenetic therapies that we could be thinking about for this group. Hopefully very soon we'll have a, a molecular subtype criteria by which we can classify all bladder tumors, including these, in, in a more um, usable manner. So is this useful, I hear you ask. Um, and, and so has everyone uh, been asking. And there are really good signs that it will be. So the group from MD Anderson who defined three subtypes showed a clear relationship to outcome here. They also showed when they looked at response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy that one of those subtypes contained patients who didn't respond well. So they're shown in yellow and they're in that P53-like um, subgroup um, in the bar chart at the top and they, they confirmed that in, a, in an independent cohort of patients. So encouraging data there. But if we're gonna use this, we have to be able to do it quickly and easily in the lab, and can we do this? And it looks as if we can. So people are working up panels of immunohistochemistry markers um, that can be used to identify these subtypes, and I've just shown the luminal and basal here, luminal on the left, um, they have high levels of FGFR3, e cadherin staining, and their keratin-5 is um, constrained in the basal layer, whereas in the basal subtype, no FGFR3, loss or very low e cadherin, and huge proliferation of those basal-type cells with the keratin-5 staining. So that's looking very encouraging. The information from the subtypes also gives ideas about um, what targetable agents there might be in those subtypes. So in the luminal subtype, we've got FGFR3 as a potential target. In the basal subtype, um, many of those, and particularly those with squamous features, have upregulated EGFR. 
There's quite a bit of information that some of these targets may be clinically useful for FGFR3, for example, which we've worked on a lot. Preclinical studies with cell lines in culture and xenografts in animals are showing that cell lines with mutations or FGFR3 fusion proteins are highly sensitive, some of those shown on the left. And the early clinical studies, this is a phase one study of a range of solid tumor types in which there were 12 bladder cancer patients. Can't identify those from the paper, um, but I know that three of them responded well, one of them with a durable response out to 10 months, and these were heavily pretreated patients. Um, and the other important thing is that, shown in gray there in the waterfall plot, the best responders were those that had FGFR3 um, fusion proteins. So hopefully there are a lot of trials going on at the moment. Hopefully there'll be a little bit more information about bladder cancer patients specifically quite soon. There's also activity in trying to understand how tumors might escape from such therapies so that rele uh, relevant combinations can be suggested. And um, we know they're probably going to escape from these treatments as single agents. And this shows work on FGFR3 where tumor cell lines are either FGFR3 dependent or EGFR dependent. Um, and in the top there on the left, if you take a panel of FGFR3-dependent cell lines and you treat them first with a, um, an FGFR inhibitor, this PD drug there, they show some response. If you treat them with an EGFR inhibitor, they show no response, but the combination is highly synergistic. And on the right there um, are xenografts and one of those cell lines showing that the combination is really significantly um, effective. So, just moving on in the last few slides from tumor profiling and what it's telling us, there's huge excitement about the effects of these new immune checkpoint inhibitors, and I'm not qualified to say much about the mechanisms by which tumors evade the immune responses, but it's very clear that these molecules program death protein 1 and its ligand, PDL1, and this other molecule, cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated protein 4, CTLA4. Um, play important roles in that immune evasion, and that some cancers are showing really excellent responses to inhibitors of these proteins. PDL1 inhibitors um, are giving really impressive results in advanced bladder cancer. So these are the three um, papers over the last couple of years that are describing this. And it looks like about 30% of locally advanced and metastatic tumors are responding. Um, and what's really interesting um, from the research viewpoint is that in Jonathan Rosenberg's um, paper in The Lancet, if you look at the bottom there, he's aligning response to those four TCGA um, molecular subtypes. Uh, not all of any one subtype responds, but it's looking like there are subtypes within those subtypes. Um, and there's a fair amount of work going on now, lots of trials. Um, they're collecting relevant tissues to... Um, uh, be able to answer the question about what are the predictive biomarkers. There's been an explosion of um, work on urine biomarkers, and I can't, haven't got time to go into detail, either based on the cells in the urine pellet or the soluble um, markers in, in the supernatant. Most of these um, are showing high sensitivity and specificity. They're usually combinations of, of markers. Um, and the idea is that they can be used for disease monitoring. The key issue, I think, is how to use the assays, and it will be up to you to, to decide whether you're going to skip cystoscopies or, or how to apply them. Um, I can, there's one issue I think is already arising and, and will be an issue, is that some of the tests give what are termed anticipatory positive results. They are so sensitive and specific that they're detecting abnormal cells in the apparently normal urothelium. Um, so perhaps this could have the opposite effect and, and increase the number of cystoscopies. This, this, this is for you to think about, but the tests are there and they're looking good. And the last thing I wanted to say was we have fantastic disease models and as we learn about these um, therapeutic targets, there's going to be a major requirement for preclinical models. So what do we have? We have mice. The carcinogen-induced tumors that were little studied to start with now these are insingenaic animals and are relevant for the immunotherapy um, agents that are coming online. We have a raft of genetically engineered mice. 
And again, they're not immunocompromised, so they can be used to study um, the, the um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. We have patient-derived xenografts, and there's a, industry is deriving many of these. And those are showing, as shown there, mutations that are present in the tumor, responses in animals that are relevant to the um, therapeutic targets they contain. There's a suggestion they may be used for um, personalized sensitivity testing. I think they may take a little bit too long to do that um, before a patient gets treated, but I think they're gonna give us a lot of information about uh, mechanisms of resistance. And then finally, we all use xenografts of human tumor cell lines, either subcutaneously or orthotopically, um, and they're there. We have cultured cells, um, Jenny Southgate's work, um, culturing normal urothelial cells in 2D or 3D. Uh, we've developed uh, a range of immortalized cell lines that are diploid and can be used as controls for all the preclinical assays. We have a 50-something tumor cell lines that subtype in the same way as muscle invasive tumors, all there ready to use. And we even have um, some work from Wolfgang Schultz's lab a few years ago better methods for culturing the non-muscle invasive tumor. So I, I think we're set to do the preclinical work that's needed. So final slide, what's next? So I think the trials that are going on are gonna tell us whether the muscle invasive subtypes have any use in the clinic. I'm sure they will. I think we'll have biomarkers for the immune checkpoint inhibitors that are coming from the big raft of trials that are going on with those agents. Some decisions will have to be made about the adoption of relevant assays in the clinic. I mean, will we be sequencing genomes or will we be doing immunohistochemistry? Can't say at the moment. For non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, I think we've got a little way to go, but I think we're gonna have proper subtyping soon and an assessment of whether any of the markers we have are prognostic or predictive. And hopefully this is gonna suggest some novel approaches to therapy. Um, and I'm particularly excited about the chromatin modifiers. I think, I think they're coming up in a minute. The clinical value of the urine biomarkers um, should be assessed quite soon, and possibly personalized assays will be developed based on these, so profile original tumor um, and, and develop an assay. And you will have to decide how to use these. The chromatin modifiers, I think, are really important um, and particularly in non-muscle invasive disease if they're suitable for that, that group of patients. And then I think there will be a lot of development of functional studies using better assays, using better models in the coming years, um, particularly organoids. So I hope I've shown you that there are exciting times and all things are probably possible. I would like you to encourage people to get into the lab. Um, some of the best work at the moment from the states is coming from clinician scientists. We have fewer of those. I think it's really important for you to encourage your trainees to, to go into research. So I'll finish there and thank you for your attention and thank you very much uh, for this award. <laughs>